It's eight o'clock, it's Wednesday evening, and welcome to Resourceful episode number five. My name's Tom Manners on Twitter, I'm at Manomatics, um, my website, tommanners.co.uk, and I've really enjoyed doing this series of interviews because I'm finding out about the greatest resources online from the creators, how we best use them, why, when, and how we should use them. And today's episode, well, my guest needs no introduction. Oh, is that, is that oh, my no, key? No, no, no. Oh, Craig, no, not yet, no! That was a gang! Oh, that was the car, that was the car! That was the gang! <laughs> I mean, the dog! This smooth, this smooth start. I'll disappear again, I'm off, I'm off. No, 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 no. You, can hear, you can hear the good introduction now. No, come back now anyway, I'll just say nice things about you. Um, no, come, come back on, it's all good. But I will, what I will do is, yeah, I've made, I've made the whole PowerPoint, and that was the idea. You don't need an introduction, you're Craig Barton for crying out loud. But if people have not come across you, um, personally, I don't think anyone's had a bigger impact on, on, on mass in, in, in this country. And you go back to when I started years ago, you started this website, Mr. Barton Maths, and that even shows some of the websites that you've been doing. Um, I think possibly your greatest impact for me, if I may say so, um, is this, because you've got teachers talking about teaching, you've got teachers thinking about it in their own time. That's not always necessarily a good thing, uh, but it, it shows our passion of it. Uh, but also you've got us thinking about more about research than ever before. As part of my great introduction, Craig, which I would have done if, if that had all gone to plan, um, I'd have mentioned this book and how effective that's been. Uh, you might not recognize the front of this book because when I bought it for my, my skit, I bought this copy, then realized oh, that's the American version. Um, but now, of course, this new book as well, Reflect, Expect, Check and Explain. Um, and these are books that so many practitioners are using. The first one is just a compendium of all the best research and it comes from your awesome um, podcasts. So at this stage, I would have gone, it's time for resourceful number five. Um, so it's a question, Craig Barton, come on down. And, and, and then what I was hoping for was one of those hellos. Oh, well, I hear hello now, but I've, I've peaked too soon there, haven't I, Tom? But um, yeah, sorry about that, but very nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. Well, uh, no, and thank you for doing this. And, and I will repeat something that you know, I've just said. You made such a huge impact on so many people. And it's you say thank you to me on behalf of anybody watching at any stage. And thank you for me as well. Thank you for what you do. Because you have you share the passion we share. And you share it with so many. And you get so many insightful guests. And I love this job. I love this career. Um, but people like you make it even more enjoyable. So genuinely, thank you. Very kind. No, thank you very much. Thank you. However, we have 58 minutes. Now, I could easily praise you for those um, or, or we could get on with it because um, I've, I'm determined we keep these to an hour and there is so much on this website today. Now, Diagnostic Questions is a website I've been using for years because I've always seen it as the most effective AFL tool. Um, and in fact, I was reading something earlier on reminded me that you put out on an email once, Dylan William. You know, we talk about formative uh, a formative assessment, but I like the fact that he, you put this out there, responsive teaching, mm. because I get teachers who say they do their AFL at the end of the lesson. I think, well, what are you responding to? Yeah. Yeah. And I really like that quote. Um, but this website has, has gone so much further because now you have created the ultimate scheme of work. <laughs> so there is a lot. These are your words, by the way. No, no, no. We're getting them already, but yeah. <laughs> um, Talk, talk. So, I mean, I don't know where to start, but to a certain degree, maybe let's start with diagnosticquestion.com. Mm. Where did it, how was it born and how has it grown? Because your, your investors now are worldwide, which shows this is hugely impactful. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, actually, to, to be honest with you. So it's me, it's me one good idea I had, and it wasn't even my idea. That's the annoying thing. So I, um, well, I must have been, how many years were I've been teaching? Maybe it's been my about sixth or seventh year of teaching. I just started at my second school in, in Bolton, and I was lucky enough to be sent out on a um, to a course at the Reebok uh, Stadium in Bolton to watch Dylan William. Um, it's the first time I'd seen Dylan live, mm -hmm. and he did. It was incredible. He did a full day, and it was all these all strategies, not just AFL, loads of different things he was talking about. But when he did, when he showed diagnostic questions, and he just showed a simple diagnostic question, and we all voted just with fingers. And it was just like a light bulb moment. I just thought, my God, this is one of the most powerful things I've ever seen because he was able to, to gauge within about five seconds the specific misconceptions that were present in, in the room. And it was incredible. And I went home that night and I was I was Tez Matt's advisor at the time and I still am now. And I thought to myself, right, if I'm a teacher and if I want to find a PowerPoint on straight line graphs, I go to Tez. And now I could go to Joe Morgan, so I could go anywhere to find a PowerPoint. But if I want to find a good question, a good diagnostic question, well, where do I go? Well, it just didn't exist. 
So I thought, right, there's, there's got to be something here. So um, what I decided to do, I wrote, I think I wrote 50 uh, questions just on a variety of topics, diagnostic questions. I started using them with my kids and it seemed to be going down well. And then any time I would give a talk around the country, um, I, regardless of what I was talking on, the last 15 minutes, I'd say, right, I've got something to show you here. Um, here's a diagnostic question. Here's how I use it in lessons. I'll do you a deal. If you write me five, I'll give you 50. And within about a couple of weeks, loads of people had sent me these in and I had about 200, 300. So then it was the deal. I'll give you 300 if you write me 10 and it grew and grew. And pretty quick, I had a thousand of these. And then I spoke to my friend who I'd written a textbook with and he's like a, a wizard developing um, like coding and stuff, Simon. And I said, look, I've got all these questions. We need to put them somewhere. I just want a simple website. This was the plan at first, a simple website where people can, teachers can go and just download a question, mm -hmm. stick it up on a PowerPoint and do, do it like Dylan says, voting with fingers. But then Simon said to me, wouldn't, wouldn't it be more interesting if kids could answer the questions online because they're all A, B, C, D and we could start collecting data and then we'd actually have data on the misconceptions. And then that was how it grew. So it grew from there that once we had, once Simon had the insight that actually this, this was far more than just a hosting website, this could be, you know, one of potentially the richest, one of the richest data sources on mathematics understanding. Like we've got now 400 million answers, something ridiculous. Mm. Um, and the insights that that shows is just, just crazy. So that, that's how, that's how it all started. And then, yeah, now it's, it's bigger than I could have ever imagined. I think it's that journey, Craig, I, I don't deny, I've stopped at the um, use in the classroom. So that's why I'm so fascinated by it, yeah. looking forward to tonight, because there's going to be so much. So I think my, I, I, we talked about it a little bit beforehand before we come on air. Um, maybe we look at the usage in the classroom, sure, definitely. and then usage outside outside the classroom to support the classroom. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, it does. And to be honest with you, Tom, it's, it's a real good point. And I always say this: that I don't go anywhere near setting diagnostic questions for homework or anything like that until my kids are used to doing it in the classroom. Because otherwise, they don't know the power of the questions. They just see, oh, this is an easy homework. I'll just guess. I'll have B for that, D for that, C for that. Whereas if you've built up this consistent use of them in the classroom, the kids are used to explaining right answers, explaining wrong answers, then they see the value of them more. So in the classroom is definitely the place to start. No technology or anything like that. And then once you and the kids are used to it, that's when we can start thinking about setting them for homework and schemes of work and all that kind of thing. So yeah, classroom's the best place to start for this, I think. Brilliant, okay. So um, is there anything particular you, at this stage you want to share? Because I know what we talked about a bit uh, as a flow chart. Then. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, if you, can, can we share, can you share my screen or should I should I do the old share screen now? You can share screen right? now, hopefully. I think I've got it turned on now. So right, let's go for it. Okay, here we Brilliant. go. So um, I thought what we'd do, I've picked out, a, I always start any talk or anything uh, like that with a diagnostic question. It's always best just to go go back to the basics with this. So Tom, we're going to get you involved here. We're going live on this. Um, oh. You haven't been prepped on this at all. <laughs> and this is um, a question written by AQA, as you can see, one of the English awarding bodies. It's a foundation um, and higher GCSE question. Okay. What I'd like you to do, Tom, uh, decide on the right answer first. Yeah. And then I would like you to make a prediction. What do you think the most popular wrong answer is? And viewers at home can play along too. Okay. Yep. Done that. Whenever you're ready, Tom, talk us through your reasoning. Okay. So what's the right uh, answer first? Well, my right answer, I believe, I hope, is B. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's sounding good. So, but I would imagine the most common misconception would be D because quite often people would just multiply the two together because they'll have seen examples of, let's say, um, I don't know, two times three and two and three would be six. So because they might have seen some of the wrong examples earlier, uh, so I would imagine the most common misconception would be D. Okay, cool. Fantastic. Right. So I'm going to build up the drama a little bit now. So um, I will show you um, in a second how I would use this in the classroom. But yeah. essentially, it would be with no technology whatsoever. Project this up on the front. Kids vote in, A, B, C, D cards, hold them up, mini whiteboards, anything like that. Yeah. And we'll get into the responsive uh, teaching nature of this in a second. But I'll just show you straight away one thing that, that not many, not enough people, in my opinion, know that you can do with, with this. So I can do this with any question on the site. I don't need any special admin privileges or anything like that. As long as I'm registered on the site, it's completely free. I don't need any kids on there or anything like that. I just create a free account, which anyone as members of a school can do. I can find any question. And if I go to the bottom and click on this insights tab, I get the data on every single person who's ever answered this question. So if I click filter my data and just scroll down, we can see this particular question has been answered 5,000 times. Wow. And if I just change that to a percentage, and I'll just make that a bit bigger for you, ah. you can see that correct, good news, B is the right answer. So one mil to you there, Tom. But A <laughs> dominates here with 39%. So if we scroll back here, what's the misconception, ah. Tom? Where, where does A come from, Tom? 
Um, factors. Yeah, highest common factor. Now, this is the thing. Now, this may be sound like the most obvious point in the world, but imagine this was just a non-diagnostic question. So it wasn't a multiple choice question. It was just, what's the lowest common multiple of 10 and 15? Now, the normal data you get there in a summative assessment is kids get it right or kids get it wrong. Whereas with this, getting it right, that's all well and good, but it's the, the way students get it wrong, the choice of wrong answer, which provides so much insight. Because if we didn't have this diagnostic nature, I'd assume, like you, the most common reason kids will get this wrong is to come up with, you know, just multiply them together, 150. But this reminds me that actually the other misconception that's lurking is if students can't distinguish between lowest common multiple and highest common factor, we can forget about the rest of the stuff. So it's the student's wrong answer that reveals the true nature of their misconception. And it was that, that for me is the essence of this. That for me is the power of this, because this, this enables us to do so many things. It enables us to respond in the classroom. So in advance, I can think to myself, if a child thinks the answer's A, I'm pretty sure why they think it's A, and I can plan in advance what I'm gonna do about it. If a child thinks the answer is D, I'm pretty sure why they think the answer is D. So again, I can plan in advance what I'm gonna do about it. So I can, I can plan for error, but more than that, because these questions have been answered thousands of times, as I'll show you a little bit later, I can find these troublesome questions before I teach the topic. So I can go in there armed with pretty good idea of where students are gonna go wrong, which as a less experienced teacher, that's absolute gold. Because I, I spent most of my five, first five years of teaching just being constantly surprised in the classroom at the mistakes kids were making because I didn't have that experience myself as a student of making these mistakes. Where, and I think that's true of many less experienced teachers. Whereas what I can essentially do with this is fast track my way to being a bit more experienced by getting a bit of a head start on the kind of ways kids go wrong. D does that make sense? It, do you know what, Craig? I, I'm already astonished by just one huge finding that I didn't know was there. And because I train teachers, and that's the, probably the most common thing I hear from new people to the profession, what's the most common mistake? Yeah. Uh, and you're, you're suddenly showing that, as you say, with that much data. One thing I want to uh, reiterate, um, you, you've, you've touched on a little bit there, but I have to pick up your book, of course. Uh, and Shane, this isn't, uh, we're not actually together today because I would have got to sign, get you to sign <laughs> this. Um, you talked about master uh, departmental meetings in the book. And this here is, is a really good example of when to do it. So you suggested one, choosing a question, um, even creating questions, but then what mistakes do you think we're going to make and why? Pass it on to the next person. What mistakes do you think the pupils will make and why? Really lovely activity to do as a department to make sure you're discussing before you're teaching these topics, what are those misconceptions so that we can challenge them before they really are embedded? Yeah, there's a couple of things with that. It, it's, it's a really good thing to do in departmental meetings, this. And again, I'll show you how you can get all this, this data and find the troublesome questions in a few minutes. But what's really nice is, particularly if you pair up experienced teachers with less experienced teachers, and you have that discussion with them, and you put up a question like this, and you just play the game we've played. What's the right answer? What do you reckon the most common wrong answer is? And then what you do is, there's two aspects of this. It's why do students get this question wrong? So why are only 47% of students getting this question right? So why are students getting it wrong? That's the first thing. But then the second thing is, what are we going to do about it? Now we know that students are probably going to go wrong on this question. What are we going to change in our teaching in advance so our students don't fall into this trap? And it's that it can be so powerful because it means you can be proactive as opposed to reactive. We know students are going to go wrong here because thousands of other students have. So what are we going to do about it? There's one extra little twist, Tom, as well on this page. And now sometimes I haven't I haven't checked this one. So this could be horrendous. If we've got small children uh, watching, you know, <laughs> cover your eyes here because we can read student explanations, real life student explanations of what they what they've given. Because every time a student answers a question outside the classroom on our app, they vote A, B, C, D, but then they also are prompted to explain why. Mm. Now we have swear filters and all that, but it'd be no surprise kids find ways to get around these. But these are often really illuminating. So oh, we also provide um author explanations for the reasons behind what, what the author suspected that the, the reasons behind the misconceptions were that's really powerful again for less experienced teachers so you have a bit of a window into where yeah, to absolutely. wrong so by default it shows you um the the uh, reasons students have given for the right answer but if i just change that to i think a was the most common wrong answer Indeed, yeah um so you get five goes into 10 and 15 if you change it from most light to longest reason this is where it could really go wrong well let's just let's just gamble oh here we go so if you change it to longest reason you often get kids who've really put a bit of thought into this 
And these reasons here, like this is kids speaking in their own words, articulating exactly where their misunderstanding is. And this is just gold dust. This is absolute gold dust because I can do so much with this. This can inform me as a teacher in advance, but also I can present students with these explanations and say, how would you help that child understand this? If, you, if you've got a kid here who's saying that they believe the answer is A because of this, what would you say to them? Not just to convince them that you're right, but help move them away from this erroneous way of thinking. So there's, there's so much I can do just on this single page that all just starts with a question. So this is my, this is my favorite page on the site, just the, the insights page from, from clicking on a single question. Is it, can you show where that's found by the way? Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. So basically you, you, any question, so you, you find any question at all. So if I just go here, and you go to questions and we'll, I'll show you how to find um, like the most popular and all that, but any question that you, you want at all. So if I just go change this drop down, I'll just move our face out of the way. If I just go to most answered questions, just to make sure we get one with a load of data, any question at all. So if I click on this question here, you'll always have that insights tab just at the bottom of that questions okay. page. And that will provide you with all that data. And if you click on filter data, you can also, by the way, I mean, this is where I'm starting to go off on one. You can start to play around with these filters. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because you can see whether um, you can change the age range. So you can see, for example, whether actually for certain questions, if you go 11 to 12 year olds, and then we also go 15 to 16 year olds, sometimes you'll get questions where younger students do better than older students. So in this case, the older ones have done all right here, 85% versus 72. But there's some topics, for example, a good one is area of a triangle. Often you'll find 11-year-olds um, do better on area of a triangle question than 16-year-olds question. Uh, 16 year olds do. And it's interesting to, to, to speculate why. So um, let me show you one other question, Tom. I've got one more, one more challenge for you here. Statistics, this is, uh, statistics fans are going to go nuts over this. They're just, they're just <laughs> licking their lips and enjoying every moment of this, Craig. Right. Well, what do you reckon, what do you reckon to this one here? So, oh, so well, same sorry. Same deal. What's the right answer? And what's the most popular wrong answer? Oh, well, um, well, I know the right answer this time, so I'm just going to make a note of it. Most popular wrong answer will be uh, da, 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 will be B. Okay, so to explain the question, perimeter of this shape, um, B will be the most common uh, misconception because uh, isosceles triangles are often uh, presented with the, let's say, the, 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 the side that has the unique length at the, at the base, at the bottom, and so they'd immediately associate the two, the left and right, uh, as I say, the, the two slanty ones. That's not the proper word, but I'm feeling under pressure here. Um, <laughs> so 18 would be the misconception, the highest misconception. The correct answer, I believe, is 21, 16 plus 5. So, yeah, it, it's because of the orientation. I mean, it doesn't look, they don't look the same either. So you have to go off the judgment of what the shape is telling you, yeah. as opposed to the assumption of what you think the shape looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have, we'll have a look at the we'll have a look at the insights here behind it. I think you're looking good on this one. So let's go percentage. Now look at that though. Only 34% of students get this right. Wow. 42 go for B. Now here's the interesting thing for me on this one, Tom. Like if you were to class this as a topic, it just go down as perimeter, right? And perimeter, you used to assume, well, that's easy. Perimeter, or well, you used to add, add up the lengths going round. But here we've got a question which nearly two in two out of three students get the wrong answer to. So what this also does for me is it illustrates that there aren't, there's no such thing as an easy topic or a hard topic. There's, there's challenging concepts, challenging questions within any topic. And it took me so many years to realize the importance of the orientation of shapes. And I, I talk about this in terms of confronting the unusual. If everything we show our kids is the bog standard way that it's to be expected, you know, tri isosceles triangles with the, the, ba the base being the different one and the slanty, as you say, uh, just kind of- It's a shame by that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, I thought I'd just bring it up again. And the, the, slant, the slanty standing up. And if, if, you know, if the first time we do, you know, powers, it's two to the power two, all these, all these mistakes that we can potentially make by confronting students with standard examples early on, they get, they get this narrow domain of understanding and all it takes is a slightly strange orientation and their world falls apart. But here's the thing, like if students don't meet questions like this, both they and you, their teacher, think, well, we don't need to borrow about perimeter. They've nailed perimeter. So it's, it's I always look for, and I'll show you exactly how to do this. I always look for the worst answered questions in any topic, just so I can look at them and think, why are students going wrong with them? And like I spoke about um, before, how can I build these into my teaching so that my students don't go wrong with these kind of questions?
And what you've, what you've done there, Craig, as well, and in fact, it was on Twitter today, someone was sharing a kind of plan as to all the things you consider. And I immediately piped up with, don't forget your standard and your non-standard. This is yeah. a great example of a non-standard representation of a question. If you show them the same triangle over and over, they're always going to think, but not, they're not going to really consider that they're going to follow a process, a procedure, the concept's lost. Exactly so that right. standard, non-standard, is a really, and, and this is a really great example of one. It is. It is. And it's again, I try and I try and hit, hit the, the earlier you show the kids the unusual, the more it just becomes the normal. That's whereas if you leave this till the end, this becomes weird and it, there's no need for this to become weird. You know, so um, I'm show you how to find. Well, I'll tell you what, let's do the flow diagram. So I'm going to I'm going to forget that flow diagram. So I'll, I'll show you this. I'll show you this, Tom. So the, the place to get this, by the way, and this this looks like a terrible, um, terrible advert for my book. And it, it is really. But if you go to MrBartonMaths.com and you go forward slash book links, this is where I've put every single diagram that's contained in my Reflect, Expect, Check, Explain uh, book. This is where I put it. Maybe you could you could link to this somewhere on the Absolutely, yeah. Tom, so people, people can get to it. So it's MrBartonMaths.com forward slash book links. And I, in chapter two of this book, I go mental because I talk all about all the ideas from my first book and, and where they are now, how, how they've developed over the course of the last two years visiting lots of schools. And a big part of that is diagnostic questions. So I've got here, if I just open this image in a new tab, I've got my big diagnostic questions flow diagram there. So I'll just move my, yeah, I'll put you there. So the way this works, this is my process for asking these questions in the classroom with no technology whatsoever. And I'll just talk you through a couple of these paths. And if anything doesn't make sense, just, just give us a yell. So I bang up the initial question on the board. The kids are quiet. I give them a bit of thinking time and whatever I deem necessary based on my knowledge and the complexity of the question. It's never too long, maybe five seconds, seven seconds. These are focused questions and not multi-step questions. The kids vote. I like mini whiteboards if the kids are used to them, if that's a regular part of their routine. I also like ABCD cards. They work particularly well. And then this, this top path is interesting. So if the vast majority get the question correct, and by vast majority, I'm talking 80% and above. Mm -hmm. 80% in a class of 30, worst case scenario, that's going to leave me with six kids who are struggling. And that feels to me about the right kind of number that's manageable that I can sort out later on during the lesson. So if the vast majority get it correct, I do a very quick check of reasons just to make sure that they're not guessing. I may chuck into the mix as well something like we've been talking about there. I may say, why might a student have come up with B for the answer? Mm -hmm. Well, how could you help them? Have a think, discuss with the person next. And if I've got time, I'll go down that route. But this will be a quick process. I'm, I'll move on. I've got enough evidence in the moment there that that understanding's there. I'm probably going to need to revisit it at some time in the future. I can't just assume that because they've got one question right, it's sorted. But that can be that can be 30 seconds from the initial question going up to me deciding to move on. But obviously what, what happens quite a lot is we end up going down this, this other path. So the kids vote and it's a mixture. It splits the crowd. Mm. There'll be some have gone for A, some for B, some for C and so on. So I always go through the same routine there. I get the students to explain their choice of answers. So if I hop back to this question, the students wouldn't know whether they're right or wrong, but I just pick a child who's answered A and say, Emma, just explain to me why you think the answer's A. And then I go to Sally, Sally, tell me why you think the answer's B. And I always go A followed by B followed by C followed by D. So I don't give anything away. I don't leave the correct answer till the end or anything like that. Now this requires what Doug Lamov calls a culture of error. Students have got to be free and comfortable and confident enough to vocalize their explanations without fear of ridicule, without fear of being shamed and so on. But the beauty of this, Tom, and again, I'm ridiculously biased here, but the more you use diagnostic questions, the more this becomes less of an issue because within each diagnostic question, there are three errors in there. And we're going to talk about those errors. We're going to address those errors. So talking about mistakes, talking about misconceptions becomes the norm in the maths class. So it doesn't matter if Emma thinks the answer is A and that turns out to be wrong because we're going to discuss A anyway. We're going to talk about that as a misconception. So the more I use these, the more errors just become a normal part of something we talk about in math. So I think that that's something um, important. So the kids explain their choice of answers and then I give them an opportunity to revote. The students still don't know whether what, what the right answer is at this stage. And then I make it crystal clear what the correct answer is. I, this is where I give my modeling. I give my reasoning. I clear up any confusion. I make it crystal clear. The correct answer to this question is C because of this, this and this. And then I give my students a follow up question. So I give them a question that's mathematically as similar to that first question as possible. And I'll show you where, where you can get these follow up questions from in a minute. And it's whatever happens in that follow-up question that's going to determine what I do next. If the vast majority get that follow-up question right, again, I've got enough evidence in the moment to crack on. 
if the vast majority get that follow-up question wrong, I've got a problem on my hands and I'm going to need to do some reteaching, remodeling, particularly if this is prerequisite knowledge. If I'm doing this at the start of a lesson to tee up something that we're going to do later on in the lesson. So for example, let's go back to this question here. Let's say I'm doing this because I'm about to teach my students how to add fractions and lowest common multiple is going to be a really important thing that my students need for this. Then if the vast majority of kids have got this question wrong, we're going to have to need to put the brakes on that and do a little bit, bit of work on that. But again, this is a scenario. I could ask the follow-up question and that could split the crowd as well. And then I've got a problem because here I've got some kids who've got two questions right and some kids who've got two questions wrong. But what I don't want to have to do is set some new work for these kids who've got it right. I don't want them moving on to another task. I don't want them moving on to the next thing in the lesson. I don't want to dig out a worksheet or anything like that. I want to give them something interesting, challenging, but that's not going to be a hassle for me to set or to mark or anything like that. So what I do, and this is also available on this page here, it's just this next one down. I give students these extension prompts. So I just tend to choose one of these. Um, so I quite like this one here. Why might somebody have chosen each of the three wrong answers? So it's enough. That, okay, brilliant. You've got this question right. You know the answer is B, but write me an explanation why somebody might choose A. Write me an explanation why somebody might choose C. So getting the students to think a bit deeper about the particular question, that's a nice one to ask. Great. Can I point out yeah, this bit as well? Please. This is where um, teachers often think about differentiation and depth. And differentiation for me is by depth. And we know that the A01, A02, A03, that we're seeing more reasoning questions, seeing more problem solving questions. This is a really strong, huge example of why teachers don't need to find 100 resources. Yeah. They actually just have these questions up their sleeve because exactly. with that, they're, they're perfect ones there. Why might someone have chosen each one? And they explain the misconception, which is a common AO2 question. So for those who are, who are really scared about going in depth, actually, that's the point of the exams now. And everything's nicely aligned that the national curriculum is, is, is um, requesting this kind of stuff where we're actually got the conceptual understanding as well as procedural. And these are the kind of questions, again, up your sleeve, no extra resources needed, but be, be, those words there convince me are really powerful as well. Convince yeah. me why those wrong in, in words while you're writing down in two sentences each one, maybe while you're then, as you suggested, working with those pupils that need that intervention. You haven't pushed them on, you have not given them another topic. You're making them think deeper, as you say. And it's from you, I heard the, from one of your podcasts, memory is the residue of thought. Um, and it's, it, it, that sticks there. They have to think about it. And uh, Yeah, you're right. And I'll, I'll tell you the beauty of this as well is these are generic. I can use these for any question, any age group of kids and so yeah. on. So the more I use these in lesson, the more kids get used to them, the less time is spent me having to explain, right, this is what I want you to do. I can just say, why might somebody chosen each of these three or, or another one? I really like this one. Uh, can you write some questions that will make each of the wrong answers right? That's a good one. So if you, if we go back to this question again, how would you change the question so A is the correct answer? How would you change the question so C is the correct answer? Again, it's no hassle for me, but it's a lot of useful thinking for the students. And of course, the, the, the ultimate is write your own diagnostic question on the topic. Now, that is hard. And I've made the mistake in the past of diving in too quick with that. Kids need a good couple of weeks experience of being used to these questions. But what a challenge that is to say to a child, all right, you've shown me you understand this question, create your own diagnostic question. You've got to get it right. You've got to think of three plausible wrong answers and you've got to explain why those wrong answers are wrong and why a child might pick it. That's about as good as it gets. Now, I know some schools, and I think it's a brilliant idea, who use that as a homework. So you finish the topic, your homework to show me you've understood this topic is write me the best diagnostic question you can. Now, again, there's your differentiation again, Tom. Same task for everybody, but what an opportunity for, sh for kids to really think deep and show you what they can do. And you get a load of questions in, you can use those questions with the, that same class, you can use it with other classes and so on. It's, it's an easy homework to mark, an easy homework to set, but a lot of thinking for the kids. So I, I really like these kind of prompt questions, I, I do. Uh, that, that's, the, the, that's the screenshot that people are currently doing and putting onto Twitter, because the, the, the easy extension ideas, as you say, uh, but also you, you made a really good point, that final one there, it's maybe one step too far. And like your diagnostic questions, it's about, well, I know the word that we often use is atomization, um, that's quite a few steps ahead, isn't it, the final one? So yes. as you say, break, breaking it down, saying, why is that one wrong? Exactly. Convince me why it's wrong. Convince me why someone might have chosen that. Exactly What's not? Right. A, and so being keen to dive into that last one, reiterating that, no, take your time. Uh, now, I know we're going to talk about the five golden rules of some of the questions um, in a moment as well, as what questions you choose. And that's the, the reason I wanted to mention this now is it's the same. 
don't try and achieve too much because then you're not sure what actually you're gaining from them. You're not focusing in on the misconception you're trying to learn from. So do you, uh, 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 should we go Tom. back to the we'll look at the, the golden rules. Tom, uh, Tom yes. and Craig, just really quickly, Jonathan Hall is on um, <laughs> oh, YouTube okay, chat. Um, and he, he just asked a question. What does Craig think about um, multiple correct answers for diagnostic questioning? Very good, very good question, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so whenever I saw Dylan speak, for, Dylan William speak for the first time, so I feel I'm on first name terms with Dylan William now. See, he invests in, he invests in diagnostic. You can get away with that. Casually drop it in there. But when, when I saw Dylan yeah. William speak for the first time, um, he, the diagnostic question he showed had two correct answers. I think there was maybe five options, two of which were right. Now, straight away, those of you who are fans of permutations and combinations, that obviously massively increases the uh, possible outcomes, which reduces the chance of kids getting it right by pure guesswork. And particularly if you don't tell the students how many correct answers there are and so on. We made a decision early on for the site that we were going to limit it, the setup to four answers, one of which is right, purely for a data analytics thing. It means we can compare questions. It's simplified down. It makes the data analytics from the teacher side much simpler and so on. In terms of use in the classroom, um, I have no problem whatsoever. Some of my favorite questions have multiple right answers. But I think that for, for diagnostic questions itself, particularly when I'm first using it with kids, and, and always when I'm setting them on, I'm setting them for homework, I always just have the one one right answer, three wrong answers. Thank, thanks for that, Adam. Um, the I know from your book, but we talked about it a little before we came on uh, on air as well. The, the the five golden rules of the question that you create, and, and I'm going to link to that now. Said about uh, we said about the, the the one step. Don't dive in too far. Um, they should be clear and unambiguous. Now, of course, if they made it onto the website, I, I hope they all are. But of course, somebody wanted to create their own. Uh, and being um, cl or clarity, if they don't, can't understand the question, you don't know what feedback you're getting. Now, well, that's it's, you know what, Tom, it's interesting these right. So um, I, I think we, we spoke about before how a really useful thing to do in departments is to analyze questions, analyze data and so on. Another useful thing to do is to write questions together. And one way I, I like to do this, building on these rules, is we get two people working together. We pick a topic, maybe it's the same topic, maybe it's different topics. And then what happens is each person writes a question on one side of the paper, but puts the four answers, their four choices of answers on the other side of the paper. And then the, their partner does the same, writes their question on one side, and then their four choices of answers on the other side. And then pe the people swap paper with each other, but just swap the question side up. So the only thing you can see of your partner is what question they've written. And then you've got to think for that question, what would I pick for my four answers? And mm -hmm. then it's a brilliant thing because you've then got a single question and then you've got two sets of answers to choose. And then you can have that discussion. Well, why did I, I didn't include that? Why, why did you choose? Oh, yeah, because you've seen that misconception. And again, it just stimulates a, a pedagogy focused discussion where you share experiences and so on. So I think writing questions is a super useful thing to do. But to come to these these five golden rules, the problem is, and I see this a lot, just because it looks like a diagnostic question doesn't mean it's a good one. Mm. And it's the same thing, just like like anything. If, ju if just because it's a card sort doesn't mean it's a worthwhile activity, just because it's a Tarsi, just because it's a star. Like nothing that's labeled with something necessarily makes it worthy. It's got to be a good quality. And I see some terrible diagnostic questions and I've written some absolute shockers in my time because I haven't had a systematic way of doing it. So these five golden rules were my way of capturing myself, kind of a bit of a checklist, just a just as a way to try and ensure some kind of consistency and quality. But some of these, like some of these, aren't, aren't as obvious as they they may seem. So the clear and unambiguous ones are a really interesting one. Um, you like you, a classic example of this is you'll get two fractions added together. Which of these is the answer? And what two of the answers will be right, but one of the answers is in the unsimplified form, and one of the answers is the simplified. And it's clear that the author wants the kids to get the simplified version. But if they choose the unsimplified, does that mean they can't add fractions together? Well, no, not necessarily. It just means that they haven't realized what's in the author's head. So you've got to be really clear in what you're asking the kids to do. And that's why number two is important, that often the worst questions are the ones that try to do too much. So a bad diagnostic, like one of the worst diagnostic questions you could ever write would be, Here's a, here's a pair of simultaneous equations, solve them. Is the answer A, X is three, Y is minus two, B, X is, the, like it's, it's nonsense. There's so many steps to get from question to answer there that if you're trying to capture all those misconceptions in four choices of answers, you've no chance. So I always break it down. It's a multi-step process. I break it down. Step one, what, what would you, which of these is a valid first step? 
And then let's assess that. Now, given you've done that, which of the, these is a valid second step and so on. So that's a big one. And that feeds in again with, with rule three. If kids are having to think for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, it might be a brilliant question, but I don't think it's going to be a good diagnostic question because if they're having to think that long, there's lots of steps going on in their head. So how are you going to pinpoint? How are you going to narrow that down and capture it within four answers? In one of your... like, sorry, go on, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Craig, no, I mean, in one of your recent emails, you, you put a suggestion of a school, I think you visited in Liverpool, and somebody shared um, the one screen of the nth, finding the nth term of the quadratic. But then you realise exactly what you're talking about here. Um, the single skill was, well, what's the second difference yeah. using that technique? And so that was that was what the teacher was honing in on. And there's your 10 seconds. Let's not forget, though, that that first question would still be strong AFL. It doesn't exactly. mean it's a diagnostic question. It's different. If you want to know the whole classroom, there's your whiteboards. What's the nth term of this quadratic? That's superb. But the single skill, if you're trying to teach them, so different questions for different phases of the lesson. The lesson that at that stage, I'm trying to teach you how to find the nth term of the quadratic. I need to test each skill at a time because of linking to point five on the golden rules here, they could get something else wrong. They, uh, is it possible to, oh no, pardon me, I've got so, I'm, I'm confusing the tip from here. You should learn something from the responses, but what have you learned if you're asking them for too many things? Well, that's it. So, I mean, the classic is a really good example of that. So let's say you ask that nth term of a quadratic and you don't, you don't break it down. You just have one question and then you have a load of kids who say, well, I've got that wrong. Well, then you've got to play detective. You've got to try and figure out where the hell have the kids gone wrong. And the chances are, if you've got 30 kids, they're not all going to have gone wrong in the same place. So then how are you going to kind of sift through that and so on? Whereas if you break it down into steps and all the kids get step one right, but then kids go wrong on step two, you, you've diagnosed it. So it's, it's for me, you're absolutely right. There's different, different questions for different times. But if I want to pinpoint exactly where in the process kids are going wrong and then respond accordingly, this goes back to this notion of responsive teaching, that's where a diagnostic question or a series of diagnostic questions can be, can be particularly powerful. That's right. You mentioned about the follow-up questions because I think that um, would be related to that as well. So yeah. how do we find those from the website? So Right, let's do it. Let, let, me, share, let me share screen because this is, yeah, this is another of my favourite bits of, of the site. So if we go to, we're on, I'll just shift my face out of the way there. Right, so we're on diagnostic questions um, and we're just on the, the questions index page here. So just, just here on questions. This is where I always start, this collections page here. So you can search by question and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But to find the good follow up questions and to be honest with you, to find some of the very best questions, the collections pages is, is the place to go. So this is where all the kind of curated question uh, content is. I'll just move that up there. So this is where you'll get uh, like the awarding bodies. So you'll get uh, AQA, OCR, Edexcel and so on. But you'll also get um, some of my favorite collections. The White Rose Maths collection for years one to eight is absolutely incredible, regardless of whether you follow the White Rose Maths. The ED collection that I've, I wrote um, a couple of years back is good, but remind me to talk about the ultimate scheme of work, Tom, because that's going to destroy <laughs> it's this. The list. It's going to destroy this ED one when this comes out. But um, so here's a good example of one: um, mathematics mastery. So um, at our school in Bolton, we don't follow mathematics mastery, but we use these questions because the questions are flipping brilliant. So if I just go into this mathematics mastery scheme of work. It's uh, just year seven at the moment, and you'll notice lots of different topic units. But what you'll also notice is there's a one and a two. And that's true of any of these collections you go into. So if I go into White Rose Maths and I go to year, let's go to the new year seven one, every single one, there's a one and there's a two. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that's quiz one and quiz two for the uh, when people use the scheme of work. But what it means in terms of using it in the classroom is you can if you find a question in quiz one that you really like to and you want to ask it in class if you also hop in quiz two you're going to find the equivalent question in the exact same place which you can use as the follow-up question so I'll show, I'll show you an example of that so let, let's go back let's do because i really like this mathematics master one say what tom just show you we haven't prepared this you pick pick a topic which one's caught your eye as i scroll down here? i always like positive and negative numbers so classic really week one two or three which one's grabbed you there three. Probably three. Not. let's go okay let's go for it so I'll crack open quiz one and quiz two, and I'll show you something nice you can do here as well. So um, here's the quiz. Um, if I click this little button here, this is a preview button, so I can have a look through the questions. And let's say, for example, that you decide, Tom, let's stop at that one there. You think that's a nice question. I just mm -hmm. want to ask that nice, simple question there. So if um, you get that, so what I normally do is I just copy the image and I'll just crack open a PowerPoint and I'll literally just paste it into my PowerPoint. 
You've got an incredibly fast computer, by the way. <laughs> um, and then what I'll do is I think, well, wait a minute, I need a follow-up question. So if I go into the uh, quiz two from that same week and I go to insights, you'll see that we get the same thing. So it's testing the same skill, but the order of answers has changed and the position of the right answers changed. So the kids can't just guess and replicate and so on. And that's that's true all the way through. So what I'll do, let's show you one other example. Let's go for, yeah, a bit, bit more of a wordy one. So I think, yeah, I definitely want that. So let's whiz that in here. So let's just put it there. And then what I'll do with my lesson as well is I'll grab the corresponding one here. I'll grab that, I'll bang that in there. And then when I'm doing my lesson and I'm doing my flow diagram, if I just hop back to the flow, if the kids get this first question right, and we just travel along this top path, where I never need to use the follow-up question. I just skip past that. But that follow-up question is always there if this first question splits the crowd and I need to use the follow-up. So if I always have two questions lined up to use in class, I've always got that initial check of understanding. And then I've got a following the discussion, I've got that follow-up question that's good to go. So that's where I always get the follow-up questions from, from that collections page. But let me show you this, Tom. You'll love this, right? Ready for this? So if I go into, so you chose negative numbers. So let's just go back to that quiz. And it was week three you went for, wasn't it? Yeah. Let's go back to that quiz. So here it is. Now, remember I showed you before that any question has an insights uh, tab at the bottom where you can see insights on a particular question. Any quiz does too. So any quiz that you've got, you can find data on how students have done on that quiz. So if I click on that insights for the quiz, then you get this page. So what you can see here is all the questions in that quiz were ordered from the worst answered to the best answered. And if I scroll down, you'll see the questions themselves and the number of kids who voted for each. So this is what I'm talking about, about being able to preempt the mistakes kids are gonna make. So let's say, for example, you're about to plan a sequence of lessons on positive and negative numbers. In advance, you can go on here and see the kind of ways kids are likely to go wrong for these. You can read the explanations like we looked at before that students have given for each of these answers. And as a minimum, you can think, well, I'm gonna ask my kids these questions in class, but more than that, as a department, you can get together and think, right, why are kids going wrong with question five? Let's read some of their explanations. And then the big question, what are we as a department gonna do about it to improve our teaching and the kids' understanding? So this for me is one of the most powerful things, being able to go into a topic, a quiz on a topic, and see this kind of data in advance and build that into our teaching. So I, I, yeah, this is one of my favorite things to do. You do this with any, any quiz, but in particular, if you use the ones from this collections page, these have been answered thousands of times. So you get some really robust data from those. I think there's, uh, I certainly want to get to the ultimate scheme of work, but I think one thing that I know I haven't used and I'm going to assume others haven't as well is the, how to get pupils on this. So is it worth sharing that if you, if you could as to how you get pupils onto the website? Yeah, easy, easy. This is going to sound, sound a terrible thing. So the, 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 there's two ways to do it. The um, This is where it starts to get a little bit confusing because this is where we, we talk about ED. So we have diagnostic questions and we have ED. Basically, me and my friend, Simon, built diagnostic questions, but we built it on some, this is this is, sounds really bad because I'm not slagging Simon off here, but we built it on some pretty old shoddy code. We kind of just pinned it together in evenings and weekends. Well, Simon did. But then whenever it got really popular, it started to kind of struggle under the strain of it. So uh, we got some investments in and so on and, and ED was born. So ED is going to be eventually what we transition everything through. Like diagnostic questions will always exist and you'll always be able to link to it in the ways that I've seen, but ED just works a lot better. So in terms of if you set quizzes for kids, if you have kids on the system, if you want to do some heavy analytics, ED is always the place to do it. So if people want to know how to get kids on, if you go, as soon as you log on to ED, it's the same login as you use for diagnostic questions. As soon as you log in, you get a load of help things here. What do you want to do? I want to get my kids on. I want to assign a scheme of work. There's a big help section there and you can chat and so on and so forth. So it's it's pretty self-explanatory. We've got like a new uploader where you can upload a, an Excel spreadsheet with all your kids' names, or you can send it in and our team will do it for you and so on and it's, it's all completely free but ed is the place to go to if you want to do some heavy analytics if you want to i'll just show you this now tom actually if you want to set up a, a scheme of work so all we've talked about so far is kind of individual questions or individual quizzes but what you can do and this will link nicely this will be seamless this this will look nicely when we talk about this ultimate scheme of work is on ed you can build you can get your scheme of work that you use in your school and essentially replicate it on ED by choosing different topic units and so on, inserting topic units and all this kind of stuff. 
And what that means is that once that's set up, your kids will automatically get set quizzes throughout the year without you having to manually assign them. And obviously they'll mark them for you and so on. And you'll get, you know, it'll mark it. It'll show you the, the worst answered questions. It'll show you the reasons kids have given for those answers and, and all this kind of stuff. So it is the place. So if you want to start moving to doing stuff online, that's the place to go. But I go back to what I said before, I wouldn't go anywhere near this until I got used to asking these questions in class, discussing right answers, discussing wrong answers, getting kids comfortable with the nature of these questions. And then it's a very smooth transition to doing it online. Whereas a lot of schools go from zero to hundred mile an hour. Kids have never seen one of these questions. All of a sudden all their homeworks are on there and it's a disaster because the kids don't know what's going on. You said something really quickly and it's got to be reiterated, Craig. Um, you, the investment you've been getting, I mean, Lego are investing in you because you're determined to keep this free. So let's just make sure that's really clear. This is, you know, you, you've got a, a, a good number of staff working for you now. This isn't just two or three. You've got all the investment and this is staying free. It always, we, we made a thing. Whenever me and Simon kind of signed our deal, our first investment deal, we said we wanted to keep this free for, for teachers in, in the classroom. And what we were kind of like happy to, to say, there'll always be something like whatever, wherever it is now, the website, that will always be free. Maybe in the future, there'll be add-ons and so on and so on, but we wanted a core thing free. What we've been able to do now with the investment is all that we've got now will always be free and new stuff that we're doing will also always be free. And our revenue stream going forward, we're looking into kind of replicating a bit of a, a tutor model, but doing it a bit cleverer than that. So we've got now, because we've got data on questions, we can say to whether it's parents or whether it's teachers, we can say, look, we've got, we've got this data, you've got this data. It's not just the fact that, you know, kids are going wrong here. We know why they're going wrong. And we know we've got this really good resource or we've got this really good, you know, whatever it is to, to help the kids out. So that's where we're thinking of going in terms of, because we need to make some money at some point. But in terms of the classroom offering and everything you've seen here and above and beyond, when, when I talk about this ultimate scheme of work, that's always going to be free. Yeah, that's that's a promise that I'm so pleased that we've been able to, to make as part of all these deals that we've done. And again, when I introduced you, Craig, thank you for everything you do. Oh, no. I'm enjoying right, this right, hour right. so much. We've only got 13 minutes left. So Right, I've got to show you this. Us. I've got to show you this. I've got to show you this ultimate scheme, Tom. I've got Go on, it. let's see it. I've got it. Right, I've got it. So it's good look. this is a world exclusive you get in here. No one's no one's seen this. I've done a few little teasers on that's emails. But on emails. This is it. Nobody, nobody's seen this live. So this, this has been what I've been working on. Since since schools have closed and all my talks have been cancelled, this has been my project. So it, it looks horrendous as it is, right? So this is a Google Sheet. It is, how many rows have we got here? So this is 257. Uh, that's 257 topic units. And each topic unit has two quizzes associated with it, as we, as we talked about before. So what we're doing here, we're going in depth you can see that the number of questions associated with each topic unit, sometimes there's 20, sometimes there's 15. We're, we're, we're talking big. These are kind of granular topics. It's not just fractions. It's adding and subtracting fractions is a quiz. Equivalent fractions is a quiz and so on. So you could take any scheme of work that exists in your school, whether it's math mastery, white rows, complete maths, whatever, it, whatever you may be following, and you can map the ultimate scheme of work to your scheme to fit it in your order. And you're going to get really comprehensive quizzes but more than that i'm going to show you a sneak preview of two of these so i'm trying to do something hopefully reasonably clever with these um so th this one's already on the system now so this this particular quiz is called percentages method selection so if i just show you percentages up here you'll see that percentages there's percentage of an amount there is percentage increase and decrease there's repeated percentages um, and then there's percentage method selection and also there's reverse percentages further down now the thing is with all that that's great, but okay, kids can increase and decrease because they've just done a lesson on increase and decrease. Kids can do reverse percentages because they've just done a lesson on reverse percentages. The only way to know if they can really understand what they've been taught is if they can method select. So all the big topics always have a quiz that challenges them to see if they can select the appropriate way of doing things from all the different kind of skills that they've learned. So I'll show you this one, percentage method select. So it's fascinating. I'll show you the insights on this as well, because I'll show you the worst answer question. So you get a straightforward one, 20% of 360. But then let's flip it around. What percent of 360 is 90? So we've got elements of variation in here. Be, I'll show you that more in the second quiz. I'll show you in a second. Then we flip it the other way around. 30% of something equals 540. And then we keep playing around with this. 
160 increased by 35 percent 160 by increased by something equals 168 something increased by and so on then we have boundary examples so i'll show you a quick boundary example so we have where is it 100% of 25 is that. So our kids used to seeing things like that with percentage, percentage of amount. 25 increased by 100 equals, and then 25% decreased by 100 and so on. So we're bringing together all their percentage operation skills that they've done together in one quiz. So the idea is you set these method select ones either at the end of units or revision to bring things together. And it breaks this, kids are just performing because they know the method versus no kids have learned this because they can select the method and that's something that i think is lacking from quite a lot of schemes of work it's all let's teach you something and then let's assess you on that exact same thing well that's great but let's make sure you can method select as well if that makes sense so so that's one feature do you want me to show you one more have i got time you last know one. you know the answer is yes great <laughs> last one last one right okay so this one i like this one linear equations one step okay solving one step now I've taught this terribly for many years. Linear, I've done all the shockers. I've done chain side, chain sign, flipping magic bridge, all, all sorts of absolute rubbish for this. Um, <laughs> but what I've also done is I've looked, I've moved too fast. We've been solving one step equations. And before I know it, we've had two steps, three steps, and it, it's all gone from there. Whereas what I want to do, if I just hop back to ultimate scheme of work, and this this will all be live, by the way. Um, if I go to plan, this will be live by I'll show, I'll show you my countdown you're getting all behind the scenes here <laughs> this. so this is my countdown i've got 50 days left to finish this i've got to write 1.66 quizzes a day to, to finish the clone quizzes to get it done on time there's 3192 questions of which 50 percent are brand new blah 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 so that's that's my life is this this countdown thing at the moment but it'll be fine so if i show you the <laughs> equations we've got solve one step solve two steps solve variables on both sides and then we've got method selection so again just to kind of build up the complexity and then bring it all together but if i show you solve one step this is where the variation comes into play so it starts off with just with uh, with this one here so what operation should replace a star this is your kind of atomization we don't want to dive in too much can, can forget about what's on the other side of the equation let's just focus on this operation that does that but then let's change it let's keep that seven constant Mm. let's keep that seven constant let's keep that seven constant and now let's start doing this okay so you're fine with that so notice this is confronting the unusual notice the first equation that kids see in this has the variable on the right hand side yeah. because if i present kids with that early on that isn't unusual that's just the way that's just the norm it doesn't matter which side your variables are whereas what i used to do is all my one-step equations would have the variable on the left hand side for ages and then the kids would look at that like what the hell is this but i want this to be normal for, for students but then let's keep that 12 and three let's play around with this 12 and three so students attention is focused on well the 12 and three are the same so let's think super hard about what's changed and what impact that has so now let's chuck a couple of negatives this is that the same question as that or is that a different is that the same answer is it a different answer now let's move the P to the bottom and see what happens. So I'm playing around with aspects of variation. I'm playing around with confronting the unusual because the variable could be on either side. And I'm atomizing it. I'm breaking it down. This is an 18 question quiz where every single equation is just one step to solve it. And yet it's depth that I would have never gone into before. So that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do with this ultimate scheme of work. Go deeper, go more comprehensive, have a better sequencing of questions and just better questions generally. So that'll be freely available. If all goes to plan towards the end of August, definitely for September, fingers crossed. Honestly, Craig, that, 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 that's phenomenal. And the reason I, I didn't even, thank you for giving me a world exclusive, by the way. Um, <laughs> right. because I knew that though, because you shared that on your, your emails that go out. So people don't sign up to your emails, do so now, because that's how I found out about it. You've been teasing it. And I had to ask about, I mean, the yeah. ultimate scheme of work. Yeah, yeah. You listen to I'm that word. I'm regretting the name. It should be called like the hopefully slightly impressive scheme of work. I've built it up too much. <laughs> But no, it's been absolutely fantastic. Now, one part of the, the hour that I've done for all my guests so far, um, I'm saving 20 seconds. I'm not going to play the music. I'm just going to say no textbook required because there are so, I, I have to get straight to, I know we want to talk about your other websites. So um, I, I've got them on screen. I can share them. Or is there anything particular that uh, if you've got them ready or should I get mine? No, fire them up, fire them up. Yeah, we'll just do a quick whirlwind. Uh, well, whirlwind a whirlwind story. indeed. Um, do you know what? I, I at least got to show the photos, you know, with, 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 me, with my... Uh, and we're going to fire up that music. Come on, Tom, Tom. We'll sacrifice one of the websites for this music. It's, you it's worth it. Choose it's a website. Worth it. Go on, let's do it. Let's do it. You made a decision, so wait. There's some mess that's been on my mind. It's all online. No textbook required.
Great Barton, give it to me. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> you know what? You were right. It was completely worth doing that. Um, right then. Uh, your many, many, many websites. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It all began with Mr. Barton Maths. It did. Years yet. That was the first one. Just sharing PowerPoint, sharing resources. Not updated it for a while, but I still host things on there. And you've got all past papers and, and various bits and bobs on there. My rich tasks are quite popular and, and so on. But yeah, when, whenever I get a bit more time, I'll, I'll plan a bit of a revamp for that. But that's that's the old. I always have a spot, a soft spot for that one. So yeah, that's that's that one. Uh, then, uh, one. I think next, if I was going to go for order, I think this was next. Uh, SSD, oh, diagnostic questions SSD, first, of course. But oh, diagnostic, yeah, when Mr. Bottom asked, diagnostic questions. Um, SSDD came first. That was the first idea from the uh, from the book that I wanted to develop. But this variation is the, the, probably the most recent one, actually. Um, and this is the most controversial one. People think I talk absolute nonsense with this. So this is my attempt to take one aspect of variation theory, in particular this notion of, of holding key aspects constant, mm -hmm. changing limited amounts in terms of sequencing of questions and examples, and developing mathematical behavior that I call reflect, expect, check, explain, to draw students' attention to those changes and get them thinking a bit deeper about the structure, get them thinking a bit deeper about the concept. So it's a way for students to practice things and it's a way for students to be introduced to concepts and ideas, but it goes a little bit beyond. And it, this has taken off big time. So I think there's now probably close to 600 re uh, sequences on here. I got sent in some cr absolute crackers a couple of days ago. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, go to, this is a little treat. I've got them. Go to alge algebra yeah. um, and go across and scroll down simultaneous equation. Oh, yeah, yeah, scroll down. And simultaneous just, equations. Simultaneous, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just look at this little beauty that got sent in. This is, this is another world exclusive for you here. Um, Wait, that one on the left, bar model. Ooh, nice. Yeah, I do. and again, this one of the beauty of this is I would never think to do this, but if you just scroll down and just keep going. You've always got your example it. problem pair. And earlier on, you said, and, and I was going to link back to this, you mentioned about having one question and then a very similar question. That's the point of the example, example problem pair to make sure exactly they've got right. that bit correct. But here we go, exactly intelligent right. practice. And then look at that. So you've got, again, so you've got these elements of variation in terms of sometimes the answers will be the same, sometimes just one aspect has changed and so on. But I would have never thought to have done it using simultaneous equations, using bar models, and the variation that goes on throughout this sequence is, is incredible. It's, it's worth checking out. It's one of my favorite ones, and this just got shared, I think, three days ago by a first-time writer, and he just, just sent me a spell and saying, I don't know whether this is any good. I'm like, this is one of the best ones I've seen. So, uh, yeah, love that love that website. Absolutely. Let's, love let's acknowledge at Mr. Gibbons. Good on him. Um, do you know, is. I use these as well sometimes to try and get that reasoning between questions. So I've done an arrow from one question to the next saying, you must write why Exactly. based on the previous question um a really, really nice, nice way of using yeah. the website and it's it's my go-to i have to say when i want practice questions um some might see drill but if they realize better than that actually it's not drill because the connections and then they can explain them ao2 it's deep i think this website works in so it's, many ways it's worth, it's worth saying though tom if it doesn't come with that pedagogy behind it like you're saying drawing kids attention to it and having that structure it is just drill it's yeah. it's the behavior that's needed as well yeah absolutely and ssdd prompts this was the first one that sprung up from the uh from my book and this is where you have four questions which look similar on the surface they've either got a similar context a similar image and so on and the challenge is can students identify the deep structure and it's to get students good at problem solving it's, it's back to method selection that we spoke about before oh it's getting, exactly it's and that's getting why... kids to think what method do i need to solve each of these questions so it's not just okay let, let's this is a good one that you've, you've shown up here let's imagine that students have just practiced how to work out let's say they've just done pythagoras and then you you could give them a load of pythagoras questions fantastic that's that's brilliant that they'll get good at them because they're good at pythagoras but then you give them a selection of questions like this. So the first job is what the hell are these questions about? There's, well, there's a Pythagoras one in there somewhere, but where is it? And then can they remember how to do all the other things that they've forgotten and, and choose when to do them and when not to do them? So this is one of my four ingredients of problem solving. It's become an absolute go to this. Whenever yeah. I finish a topic, I think I'm going to SSDD it. I'm going to put that current topic mixed in with other ones that look a bit like it and see if my kids can figure out what's going on. And often they can't, but I'd rather them identify that now with my support than get one of these questions in isolation in an exam and not have a clue what's going on with it. And so this, is the per this is the perfect example of when, um, if you give them all the same question all the time, um, well, actually they're not practicing, they're, they're seeing the same image, they're not. They're following a procedure, they've got to choose the procedure, they've got to choose what method. This is great with year 11, I see quite often yeah. when people are worried about build up for exams, 
uh, that shoes. I mean, that's the biggest thing in problem solving. What is the method I need? Of course. Well, if you've just taught them a topic and you've done 12 questions exactly the same, they don't need to choose a topic. They don't. And it's that classic thing, like the, the kids do a mock exam, they get a question wrong, you go through it in class and they say, oh, if I'd have known it was that topic, I'd have been able to do it. But <laughs> that's the thing. If you don't know what topic it is, you're wasting your time. So your method selection is something I've undervalued for many years. Absolutely. We can't not mention maths vens. But because you know what? Nobody talks it's about it. It's sad, this, it's sad this, Tom. It's the forgotten baby of this. Like, I think Variation Theories had over two, two and a half million visits. Uh, SSDD, one and a bit million. Maths is about 80,000. I think it's only me and my wife who visit this, and my wife does it in the <laughs> US. But these, again, it's another of absolutely fundamental part of problem solving for me. There's so much richness that you can get out of, out of this setup of questions. I mean, that question there, again, you, what's nice about these is sometimes if there's an area that's not possible, why is that? Exactly and I, right. I know I went straight to this when I was talking about rectangles and squares, parallelograms, and I, I, went, I thought this was the perfect website for it because the subsets um, and the different type of looking uh, very, um, Vens as well, a circle within another circle, set within a set, um, just the conversations. This, this is AO2. You can't, and, and further actually, yeah, you absolutely. can't get away with this. This is nothing to do with fluency and, and getting lucky. You have understanding when you're doing absolutely these. Right. And as you say, if, if the kids can't find an example for a region, is it because they simply haven't looked hard enough or is it because it's impossible? Well, you've got to convince us which, which one is it. So it's, yeah, it's all in there. And actually, it's worth saying, Tom, for each of these websites, I also have a please read section, which gives kind of pedagogy tips, hints and so on and so forth or an about section, you know. So there's there's always tips there so that hopefully teachers can get the most out of them. But I should say, by the way, I write a bundle of these, but then teachers from all around the world send me these in every single day. And it's like it's time consuming, but it's an absolute pleasure because it, I just learn so much. And that's why I'm, I'm happy to do it. Craig, I'm, I'm told I'm enthusiastic, um, but listening to you for the last hour, <laughs> you're, you're, you're the man, you deserve the credit you get. Um, thank you so much for the time, not only this evening, but for everything else you've done over these last few years. And I can tell it's not going to stop, is it? That passion is still there with you. No, whether I've, the energy is still there, that's another question. But the passion, the passion is definitely still there. Um, yeah, it's becoming harder. Now I've got my, my, little, my little eyes up bumming around, but it's... Um, no, I, I do it because I learn a load from it. People send me stuff in and it just blows my mind. So I'm more, I just see myself as just kind of a sharer and a curator these days. I come up with simple ideas, build it up to a certain level and then just release it. And then people just take it in ways that I would have never imagined. So it, it makes me so happy to do that. Craig Barton, um, I, I don't know how to say it more in many other ways, but thank you so much. My Honestly, pleasure. it's been a pleasure. No, this has been an absolute joy. Cheers, Tom. Thank you.